Tonight with Patrick Moore. I'm at Pasadena, California, and behind me you can see one of the most important scientific centers in the world, the JPL, or Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Twelve years ago, the Voyager spacecraft were launched. They've just completed their tasks. It's here that we have the control center. Here that we receive the pictures and data from the furthest reaches of the solar system. With the Voyager 2 pass of Neptune, we've come to the end of an era. And there's only one place we can be to look back over this fascinating period, here at the JPL. In the early 70s, it was recognized that the uh, outer planets were in a position such that uh, we could go fly by every one of them with two spacecraft. Our primary target at uh, Saturn was Titan. And so Voyager 1, was targeted to fly, make a very close pass by Titan. And if it was successful, then we would target Voyager 2, the aiming point to go on to Uranus. Of course, you were concerned with the design of the cameras. Yes, oh yes, we were, I've been involved with the design of the cameras from the very beginning. Nowadays, everyone talks about CCDs, charge couple devices, but they hadn't been invented when Voyager 2 was launched. Well. They had just, some had been coming along. We knew they were coming along, but they were not nearly ready for a space mission. And uh, as a matter of fact, the first uh, CCDs at Jet Propulsion Laboratory were being uh, purchased for the space telescope. They are uh, extremely small. This one has 800 by 800 pixels, which is exactly the same format we have on the Viticon for, that is in uh, flying on Voyager. The Voyager Viticon is a much larger tube, of course, and uh, it takes has coils uh, around it to make it uh, the, the electron beam scan. And this is uh, one of the surplus from the Voyager imaging uh, instrument. Interesting to compare the two in size. Yes. They're, uh, considering they both have 800 by 800 pixel formats, about the same pixel size, 15 micron pixels. Did you expect the pictures to be so spectacular? Well, I, uh, I had high hopes for the, uh, for the pro project, and uh, I certainly didn't have uh, any idea how spectacular they would be. Uh, I think perhaps the greatest surprise and, and joy for me was uh, Miranda, and the reason was that our targeting to get, go on to Neptune at Miranda was such that we, we couldn't really get very close to any, any of the larger satellites, only to the small satellite Miranda. And it had to be timed absolutely perfect to get close. The Voyagers are probably the most successful unmanned spacecraft ever launched. Voyager 1 bypassed Jupiter and Saturn. Voyager 2 went on to Uranus and Neptune as well. But they're not big. This is a full-scale model of Voyager 2. I stand just a bit over six feet. And from that, you can see how surprisingly small a Voyager really is. This seems a good moment to look over some of the highlights. So let's begin in 1977 with the launch first of Voyager 2 and then of Voyager 1. Both crossed the asteroid belt safely and reached the neighborhood of Jupiter in 1979. Spectacular pictures were sent back, not only of the planet itself, but also of its satellites. So what were the highlights? Well, Voyager found a thin, dark ring, not on the least like the wonderful ring system of Saturn. But I suppose that the number one on the list must be the vivid colors of the upper clouds, which, as we know, are rich in hydrogen and hydrogen compounds. They told us a great deal about Jupiter's weather systems. The great surprise is that the weather systems on Jupiter are driven very much like those of the Earth, in spite of the fact it has a tremendous amount of internal heating. We looked very surprising when we first saw these winds and these motions of tremendous turbulence, but the driving forces are very much like mechanisms we're used to seeing on the Earth. 
Then, of course, the great red spot, which we thought might be a solid or semi-solid body floating in Jupiter's atmosphere, or then the top of a column of stagnant gas. Of course, it isn't either. It's a kind of a whirling storm. Did that come as a surprise to you? Very much. I think more so is that the red spot and all the other spots we've seen on Jupiter are one members of a very large family. The red spot is simply the largest, and it is, in fact, a huge vortex, but gains a lot of its energy by the other smaller spots. It sucks into it from time to time. But the surprise, the feature we still haven't really solved, is its colour. It is bright red at times, it changes its colour from time to time, but it looks quite different from the white ovals next to it. It is a local chemistry, something we still don't understand. But we must remember that Jupiter has an extensive system of satellites. We knew that Callisto and Ganymede were large and bright. We knew that Io had a strange colour and was different from them but we didn't have very good ideas at all about why they were different and in which ways they were different. Well, Io's volcanoes are really violent. Very. It's the most volcanic object that we've seen in the solar system, including the Earth. What drives Io's volcanoes? Uh, the basic energy drive almost certainly has to be tides raised by Jupiter. These are body tides raised in the, in the solid material of Io. And, uh, uh, the idea of the tidal energy was developed uh, uh, only just uh, months, really, before the uh, Voyager encounter in 1979. Uh, if Io were just by itself around Jupiter in a nice self-respecting circular orbit, there would be tides, but there'd be no changes in the tides because they'd always point directly toward Jupiter. Uh, because there are other satellites there perturbing its orbit slightly so that it's always just a little out around and doing a, an eccentric orbit, uh, the tides change slightly as Io goes around because Io changes its speed going around Jupiter. And that change in the tides drives energy into Io's crust by way of friction. Of course, they're sulfur volcanoes, aren't they? Well, there are many types of volcanism on Io, and we're still sorting them out. We believe there's ordinary volcanism of the sort that we see on the Earth with silicate lavas and uh, making large uh, uh, volcanic craters, which we call calderas. Uh, there are also, also these things that we see which are large plumes extending above the surface, one to 200 to 300 kilometers. And these plumes, we believe, are actually more akin to what on Earth we would call geysers. And those, we believe, are driven by sulfur and sulfur dioxide encountering hot material underneath Io's surface and erupting into space more or less in the manner of a rocket nozzle. Why is Europa so inert when Io is so active? Well, it appears to be inert. One first-order answer, if you will, is that it's further from Jupiter. The tides raised are not as big. The tidal energy going into Europa is not as large. However, it's still very strange. We do not see big craters on Europa, and we didn't get very good pictures of its surface with Voyager, so we really don't know just how inert it is. Ganymede and Callisto aren't exactly like each other. No, and uh, again, the difference is one of the things that Voyager found that was surprising. We have ideas, but no firm uh, uh, knowledge yet of exactly why they're different. Uh, they're very similar in size and overall density. Uh, Callisto's surface seems to be uh, rather ancient, uh, completely battered with, with craters, uh, while Ganymede's surface has areas that look just like Callisto, but areas that are very obviously have been much more geologically active at some time in Ganymede's past. I think we may find out with our next mission to Jupiter. Well, Terence, you're a project scientist of the Galileo mission. Yes. You to get there in 1995, and I imagine you're looking forward to that very eagerly. Oh, yes. That's uh, going back to some of these places that Voyager gave us our first looks at is a very exciting prospect. Good as Voyager was, we're going to be even better with Galileo. We'll get much closer to the moons, get pictures that are 10 to 1,000 times more with more resolution in them. Uh, and I don't think Voyager found all the strange things in the system. I'm sure there are discoveries and surprises awaiting us. Leaving Jupiter behind, the Voyagers went on to Saturn. Voyager 1 in 1980, Voyager 2 in 1981. We expected surprises, and we got them. Certainly we found the fastest wind speeds anywhere in the solar system yet in the cloud tops of Saturn. That was a great surprise. We did know of one or two spots that have been seen by observers over the last sort of years, a few years or so but certainly we found a lot more. And that gave us a chance to get the wind profiles from one pole to the other. And it was surprisingly symmetric. And the weather systems, are in fact, are driven by the same sort of mechanisms we found on Jupiter. So it was indeed great similarity between the two planets. The glory of Saturn is in its ring system. Before Voyager, we thought that the rings were fairly straightforward. Two bright rings and at least one dusky ring. And they're not like that a bit. 
But if you started to count the strands, they would go on and on and on. There are probably tens of thousands of them. So the big question is not so much how many ring strands are there, but why are they apparently so stable? Can it be due to the satellites? Well, the satellites probably contribute something, and I think one of the major interests was that we did find some shepherding satellites on one of the outer rings, keeping these tiny braids together. But what, what we haven't been able to find are within all these numerous little strands collections of other small shepherding satellites. They have yet to be found. They're possibly below the resolution that the Voyager's cameras were able to observe. How do you explain those extraordinary radial spokes in Ring B that really shouldn't be there? The, that was a pretty difficult thing and in fact a great surprise because one of the aspects is that, that Saturn, like Jupiter, has an intense magnetic field. Within those rings there are huge electrical disturbances, tens of thousand times stronger than any sort of thunderstorms that we can get used to on the Earth. I remember the amazement at the discovery of the braided ring, the ring F. Well, certainly the first time we saw it, we were surprised to find a ring so far out. But then, of course, when we looked again for Voyager 2, we saw it, it seemed to have several strands, rather like a piece of string. Again, its stability is not really understood. It seems to be strands of varying thicknesses and change, almost knots in some respects, changing as you look around that area. But certainly, again, these rings of Saturn are far more complicated than we first anticipated. And they could be connected with the icy satellites. There's one that extends right out to Enceladus, which had a strange, smooth surface. I think this is the important discovery, that the majority of the satellites of Saturn are, in fact, icy satellites. There are lots of collisions taking place. We've only got to look at the, the satellites to see how pitted and, and smashed some of these are. Mimas, for example, with that huge crater. Well, certainly, if that crater had been much larger, had been a, dis a collision of much greater force, it may have broken Mimas in, into a whole collection of tiny pieces. So suddenly, the collisions chipping off pieces of ice they will be, the ice will be brought in towards Saturn, perhaps replenishing the rings. So per perhaps Voyager has told us that if we have, as long as we have satellites around Saturn itself, composed of water ice, then we'll always be populating the rings around Saturn. But then, of course, there was Titan. Well, this really was meant to be the star of the mission. The original mission was to Jupiter, to Saturn, and to Titan. We always wonder what it was going to be like. But I think the really important discovery that this was the first nitrogen atmosphere other than our own planet that we've yet to find. It's cold out there, but it is an earthy-like planet, a surface we have no idea what it's really like, but one in which we probably think we have the sort of primordial soup that gave rise to the Earth at the time the solar system was developing. But more importantly, what we learned about Titan was such a highlight, we felt that the Voyager mission had been, at that stage, a great success. As Voyager 2 drew away from Saturn, there was a temporary loss of signal trouble with the scan platform carrying the cameras, but eventually it was sorted out. Voyager 1, by the way, wasn't going on to Uranus and Neptune. If it had, it would have had to have missed out on Titan. So everything depended upon Voyager 2. And in January 1986, we again assembled here at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, ready for the next encounter with Uranus. It's been a very difficult series of years since the Saturn encounter. You may remember, just before the Saturn encounter was over, Voyager 2 seemed to have a very serious problem with part of the scan platform which seemed to be failing. And for several years, the engineers wrestled with it until they finally understood it and got the spacecraft back into some form of working order. But of course, as you go further and further out through the solar system, the signals you're sending back are weaker and weaker. And obviously, we want to get as much data back as possible from these first chances to get to Uranus, and then on, hopefully, to Neptune. The engineers, in fact, then developed a tremendous amount of work to increase the capability of the deep space network, raising its capability. In effect, moving Uranus closer into Saturn with the plan to move Neptune in as well, so we'd learn a lot more from these planets when the spacecraft finally got past. But of course, Uranus has problems all its own. This extraordinary axial tilt means that the spacecraft approached it pole on. Well, we really had no idea what to expect at Uranus. Yes, we knew it was there. We'd never seen a feature on the planet. In fact, all the time flying in with Voyager getting closer and closer, I remember having numerous conversations with my colleagues saying, I wonder if we'd ever find any spots on the, on the atmosphere of Uranus. We found a few, not many, but then when we looked at the planet very carefully and tried to enhance the pictures, we saw there were one or two large convective storms. And they gave us an idea about the wind patterns but not really uh, so much information as we'd had from Jupiter and Saturn. Certainly looking pole on was very much a complication. They seem to be zonal motions as we've seen before, but that Uranus is peculiar, it doesn't have internal heating, and that makes it very odd compared with Jupiter and Saturn. It does have a very curious magnetic field. 
This is perhaps the most extraordinary thing of all. Again, we had no idea how long the Uranus day was, and it, it requires the measurement of the magnetic field. Finally, it was discovered. But then the most peculiar thing was, not only were we looking at the planet end on, when we discovered the magnetic field, we found the axis of rotation for the magnetic field was offset 60 degrees to the axis on which the planet rotates. We knew about the rings. They'd been discovered way back in 1977 by the occultation technique. We didn't know a great deal about them. Well, we knew they were there. We didn't realize just how dark they were. In fact, they are probably the darkest thing we've yet to discover in the solar system. They're like coal dust. And again, when we found that Saturn, we thought that we knew there were a few ring strands, but not how many. And as we got closer and took more and more pictures and scanned across there, we found that there were hundreds and hundreds of tiny little uh, strands making up these very complicated rings of Uranus. I remember the first major discovery of the Uranus encounter, the discovery of the largest of the small inner satellites. Yes, it seemed at first that we had sort of a mini collection of tiny little satellites near Uranus, suggesting that there had been a large number of collisions. And again, that may help to sort of populate the material around Uranus that gave rise to the rings of Uranus. Obviously, there have been many collisions. But the greatest sufferer seems to have been Miranda, the smallest and innermost of the five satellites of Uranus known before the Voyager encounter. And there, these collisions have produced an amazingly varied landscape. Well, again, as with many of the places we visited with Voyager, we found a surprising de degree of diversity. Uh, the outer satellites, uh, uh, Oberon and Titania, uh, appear relatively non-active geologically, uh, somewhat as Callisto in the, in the Jovian system. Uh, Oberon has a very heavily cratered surface. Uh, Titania, a heavily cratered surface, but with some evidence of faulting on its surface, indicating it might have had some early geological activity. Uh, Umbriel is, in fact, the strange member of the system. Umbriel has big craters on it, but a uniform dark surface. And we don't really know exactly what its history has been. It appears to have an ancient surface, but it is so uniform that we think there may have been some sort of resurfacing event that occurred. What about Ariel? Ariel appears to have uh, fault graben structures on it with uh, icy cryovolcanism having occurred in its icy surface at some period in its history. There are places where the craters are wiped out. There are things that look like glaciers on the surface of Ariel. How do you explain Miranda's geology, or can't you yet? Almost certainly you require some form of energy other than just the decay of radionuclides, which is going on in the rocks in these bodies all of the time. It's so small that it must have cooled off if, uh, long ago if that were the only source of its, uh, of its energy. Uh, there are several uh, theorists studying the dynamics of the orbits of Miranda and Ariel who believe that while they are not now in a resonance condition such that you can get tidal energy in them, uh, that they very likely have passed through a period of tidal resonances in the past which could have pumped energy into them at some point in their, in their geological history. What about the, um, the new inner satellites of Uranus discovered by, by Voyager? Well, we only got a really good look at one of them, uh, now called uh, by the International Astronomical Union, Puck. And uh, it's a, it seems to be a fairly irregular object, heavily cratered, very dark. And these objects, to me, represent probably what a lot of the original material that went into all the satellites must have looked like four billion years ago. We left JPL after the Uranus encounter in a state of excitement. Neptune lay ahead, and sure enough, in the spring of 1989, pictures started to come through. And we saw at once that Neptune, the blue planet, showed much more detail than Uranus, even though it's no larger and it's much further away. In fact, signals from the spacecraft near Neptune took over four hours to reach us here at Mission Control. Distance is terribly important and very complicated when you think about controlling the spacecraft. Not only controlling it to take out particular maneuvers, but also getting the observations set up and performed in this particular way. We were very concerned about making sudden changes. In the way, in fact, were need to make some changes in the sequences very close to encounter. A few days, in fact, before we got to our closest approach at Neptune, we realized that some of the exposures for, the, for Triton were, in fact, going to be inappropriate because Triton appeared far brighter than we ever thought, and the exposures that we had planned for those images, had we would continue to use them, we wouldn't have seen any detail on the satellite. It would been a totally saturated image. So somehow the engineers managed to, to overcome these problems, and we've now seen the most remarkable encounter, everything working perfectly satisfactory, and every piece of data perfect. What were the highlights of the Neptune encounter? 
without doubt, I think if we, if we take it from all the things we didn't know, we didn't know how long a day was on, on Neptune. We now know, in fact, it's just over 16 hours and three minutes. We now, of course, have got the magnetic field detail and found that the magnetic field, in fact, is offset. That, again, is a great surprise to us. Coming down into the atmosphere, we now find the atmosphere is amazingly active. Without doubt, finding a planet which has so little energy, finding weather systems as big, as active, was a great surprise. What about the great dark spot? Well, I think that the important thing about that is that we've now found another large anticyclonic feature, a feature that looks rather like the great red spot on Jupiter. We're trying to understand more about why these features should, should exist, but also the way, in fact, it's caught up into the very strong winds. We found the strongest retrograde winds anywhere in the solar system now exist on Neptune, reaching speeds of more than 700 miles an hour. And they occur in the neighborhood of the great dark spot. Then, of course, to the rings, whether we're going to be ring arcs, but of course we now found we have three continuous rings, clumps of material. Some of the material may be continuous, there may be material within the rings going right the way down to the planet itself. Out to the moons, six more moons. Most of the ones that are discovered are very small and very dark, but without doubt, Triton must be the highlight. We knew Triton was there. Certainly we know that the density of Triton would suggest it has a closer relationship with Pluto, so Triton, in fact, has come from outside the Neptune system. It's rather sad, in fact, that we're not going to have a look at Pluto with this entire mission. But certainly in the case of Triton, probably a captured object, but in fact may give us some clues to other material that's in the outer solar system as a whole. At the start of the Voyager program, the project scientist was Dr. Edward Stone. He is still a project scientist today, and you've seen it all the way through. What are the main highlights, do you think? Well, certainly at Jupiter, the highlight, the thing which caused the largest revolution in our thinking was the discovery of eight vol active volcanoes on Isle. And that, in fact, taught us how important evolution is in the, uh, in the formation and change in these planets. At Saturn, certainly, one of the major surprises was all of the fine structural detail that we discovered in the rings of Saturn. And, of course, there was Titan itself, where we measured for the first time an atmosphere 60% higher pressure than here on Earth, mainly nitrogen, with an interesting hydrocarbon chemistry. There were two surprises at, at Uranus, at least. One was the fact that the magnetic field was tilted by some 60 degrees from the rotation axis, the first time we'd ever seen such a thing. And then there was the moon Miranda, a small world only 500 kilometers across, but which had experienced a very intense geologic activity sometime in the past, which significantly changed its surface. At Neptune, we had a number of uh, surprises. So one of the surprises was it also had a tilted magnetic field, but the big, perhaps the highlight of the whole uh, encounter was the moon Triton, the first moon we've seen, which is so cold, uh, almost 400 degrees below zero Fahrenheit, so cold that the surface has solid uh, nitrogen and solid methane on the surface, and uh, the geology uh, was reminiscent of many objects we'd seen before in the solar system. So the Voyagers are on their way to interstellar space. We'll keep track of them for some years yet, and they might even help us to locate the outer planet X, which I'm sure exists, but that lies in the future. So let's give all credit to those who planned and built the Voyagers and controlled them from here, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. In less than a dozen years, they've increased our knowledge of the outer solar system many hundreds of times. They've done all and more that their makers could have hoped. The only sad note is that as they move away, their signals will fade. Eventually, we'll lose them. And will any other civilization ever find them? I'd like to know. Good night. <laughs>